Hi everyone, my name is Elliot Weisblut. In collaboration with John Gillick and Carmen Acella of the UC Berkeley Center for New Music and Audio Technology, we have written a paper titled Synthesis by Layering, Learning a Variational Space of Drum Sounds. In this paper, we train a variational autoencoder to reconstruct input snare drum samples using a small predefined library of existing samples. Specifically, the model controls the amplitude weights applied to this predefined library, which it modulates to create a layered, reconstructed sample that falls as closely to the original as possible. In more simple terms, our system chooses a combination of samples that, taken together, sound similar to an input sample. By using a variational autoencoder, we create a smoothly interpolable latent space which mixes and swaps samples as you navigate through it. This gives music producers a powerful tool to assist in the cumbersome process of layering. Layering is when a producer selects multiple drum samples which they tune and stack to create a new sample with a unique timbre and texture. Layering is an extremely common practice, but it's also extremely time consuming and difficult. Producers seeking novel sounds are tasked to parse through a huge amount of samples which could be combined and modulated in nearly infinite ways. The task of selecting these samples is difficult, as it's often hard to listen to a sample and understand its place in a larger combination. Furthermore, there's no easy way to rapidly change component samples while smoothly modulating the output. So, overall, we seek to automate the selection of component samples to assist pr producers in finding the proper building blocks to achieve a desired sound. Furthermore, we'd like to give producers the ability to modulate that sound quickly and, a per and in a perceptually smooth manner through the mechanism of rapidly and automatically swapping and modulating component samples. To elaborate on the use case of this system, the desired sound may be something close to a sample that the producer has already selected. In this case, the producer may feed that sample as input to our system and take as output a linear combination of samples that produced a sound that matches the input perceptually. The producer may then, by navigating the latent space close to that of their input, fine-tune the sound to their desired output. If the nearby latent space fails to meet their criteria, they will at least have a combination of samples to begin working with manually. This will at least give them a strong backbone upon which to build their novel sample. The producer may be in a more exploratory workflow. In this case, they may want to explore the latent space to its deepest ends. Without necessarily inputting a sample they know is close to their desired output, they may want to vary the latent variables, hoping that they will find a combination of samples that is appealing. Presuming the latent space is perceptually smooth, this should be a relatively simple task. From there, they may modulate that sound by either fine-tuning the latent variables or manually modulating the samples that the system has output. So, our desired features overall are good reconstructions, so when the producer inputs a target sample, the output should sound at least relatively close to the input. We want perceptually smooth interpolation within the latent space. This is critical to the fine-tuning and exploration process, and indeed, our latent space as you navigate it, produces new sounds by automatically swapping and mixing different samples from the predefined library. Also, we want sparse output, because realistically, no producer is going to create a novel sample from a linear combination of more than three or four component samples. In the context of this project, we talk about interpretability a lot, and it can take on a few definitions, so it's important that we're clear about the manner in which our system is interpretable. This is how I'm thinking of interpretability in the context of our system. The producer can see the component samples as well as their weights in the output of the system. This should be able, or rather, they should be able to watch the composition of the output change as they navigate the latent space in real time. This provides a distinct advantage over previous drum reconstruction systems which output waveforms directly. Our data set was built from a broad collection of drum samples from professional sample libraries. We chose these samples because they represent real-world examples of the types of material used by producers in practice. Some of these samples are live recordings of unprocessed drums, while others were created by professional sound designers using a range of synthesized, sampled, and processed sources. 
We constructed a data set of 2,495 snare drum samples from this collection, then pre-processed them to unit amplitude, a sample rate of 22,050 Hz, and one second in length. From this data set, we selected 200 samples to use as our source samples, which are linear linearly combined as output. These samples were chosen using the greedy Frank Wolf algorithm for exemplar selection which selects the n samples from a collection that are best able to represent the others as linear combinations. The other 2,295 er, samples are split into a train valve test set. To featureize the samples, we follow a heuristic proposed by John Gillick in previous work related to target-based orchestration. For each sample, we compute a magnitude spectrogram at 44 frames per second with a hop size of 512 samples. We average the spectral features across the time dimension, weighing by the root mean squared energy at each frame. We collapse the time dimension to emphasize the timbre near the onset of the sample, while ignoring quieter tails that tend towards white noise. To gain some information about the envelope, we concatenate the log attack time to each 2048 dimensional representation to produce a final 2049 dimensional representation. So now, let's talk about the model. The model itself is actually quite simple. In our variational autoencoder, we use multi-layer perceptrons, dense layers, for both the encoder and decoder. The encoder consists of a single 1500-dimensional hidden layer, which feeds directly into a 64-dimensional layer representing the mean and standard deviation of our 32-dimensional latent variable. We sample the latent variables and feed them into the decoder. The decoder consists of a single, 144-dimensional hidden layer, which is fed into the 200-dimensional output space, where each node is a normalized weight applied to our predefined library. The weights are then multiplied to their respective sample, and all 200 samples are layered with each other to produce the final output. We train our model in two phases, a discriminative pre-training phase and a generative training phase. During the pre-training phase, we feed the 200 source samples through the model as training data with loss calculated by binary cross-entropy. The model is rewarded for choosing the correct source sample. This gives the model a sense of its output space, which we find useful during the generative training phase. During the generative training phase, we feed novel samples as input and measure loss by processing the output in the same way as the input, then measuring mean square error. This produces our final model, which we evaluate in several ways. One of the main reasons for using generative models like variational autoencoders in creative settings is that they can provide a mechanism for controlling high-level properties of model outputs by manipulating latent representations. We want an embedding space that captures smooth perceptual transitions. Although interpolating through the latent space rapidly swaps samples to produce a particular sound, the sound should modulate smoothly in timbre, texture, and frequency. We approximate these perceptual qualities of generated drum samples using 13 MEL frequency spectrum coefficients, as well as energy-weighted spectral centroids. For comparison, we compute distances in weight space, the space of possible mixing coefficients, via the Euclidean distance between the 200-dimensional output weight vectors as we interpolate between embeddings of samples A and B. We tested 200 random pairs from the test set and found that, on average, the output weights change linearly as we interpolate between two points. The two timbral features of the generated samples also vary similarly. Notably, interpolation does not produce linear paths between each individual pair of samples. Sometimes, the weight distance varies significantly between samples A and B before it's settling at either sample. This suggests that the model hasn't converged to a trivial solution of turning all 200 mixing co coefficients up or down at the same time. Rather, the model swaps different source samples in and out of the layered mixture, indicating that the embedding space has captured some abstract features of the data that correlate with timbre. This means that, for example, when decoding from an embedding ZC, that's halfway between ZA and ZB, as we see on the figure here, we might get an output drum sample with timbral characteristics somewhere between A and B, but which highlights a drum layer that is not used at all when we decode ZA or ZB. We argue that this property may be useful for finding new layering possibilities. In order
order to organize the interpolation for an end user, we run principal component analysis, PCA, on the latent vectors encoded by the model for the entire snares dataset to extract 11 eigenvectors corresponding to the directions of maximal variance. By manipulating latent representations of layered samples along these dimensions, we hope to uncover relationships between the learned latent space and perceptual dimensions. For example, one might find that varying the latent variables along some principal component corresponds to a perceptual shift in frequency. Another pr principal component might correspond to sharpness, etc. We organize PCA manipulations as sliders in our interactive prototype. By changing the value of a slider corresponding to any particular per, uh, principal component, the user traverses the embedding space to produce novel output samples. I'll now demonstrate this to you using a pre-recorded video we made to demonstrate functionality. You can see that as we vary a latent vector along the principal components, we find that timbre, frequency, and texture are modulated. In practice, the principal components are unpredictable in regards to the exact perceptual quality they will correspond to across different samples. One input sample might increase in frequency along the first principal component, while another decreases in frequency along the same dimension. You might have noticed some noise artifacts present in the output from the video. Recall. One of our goals was to have a workable reconstruction, and these artifacts are a hindrance to that. Since we're focused on designing a model that holds potential as a creative tool for exploration, we do not emphasize the quantitative performance of the model's reconstruction accuracy. Indeed, other methods, such as the matching pursuit algorithm, may be more suitable for optimally approximating a given target from a linear combination of sources. We are more concerned that the model is capable of approximating the core timbre and texture of most of the samples in the validation set. This undercurrent of noise is largely due to a large number of lowly weighted source samples. It's possible to mitigate this effect by removing all source samples from an output with weights lower than a certain threshold. We know this works because our output space is sparse. You can see from this figure that most of the time, no more than 14 samples um, meaningfully contribute to the output sound. And for the most part, the number is around two to four. We've also created a higher fidelity mockup of our final user interface. Thank you for your time. We hope you've enjoyed the presentation.